All right. It is six o'clock and we are ready to go. Welcome to our evening Bible study. This is the third in the series of uh, Advent. This is the third week of Advent. And we are coming to you this evening from the Ebenezer United Methodist Church. And I am Pastor John for all those who are watching us on Facebook. Uh, I'm Pastor John, and I will be leading us through this evening of uh, Bible study on, the, uh, on Advent. The theme for this evening is joy. The theme for this evening, for this week, is joy and or peace. And so uh, let's go into the word of prayer. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship. We pray now, God, that your presence be with us as you have always been. We ask that you open our minds so that we can receive your word and that which you have for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So this, this evening, we're going to be talking about uh, joy. Uh, the theme for Avon is joy. As you can remember, we went through uh, hope, which was the, week, the first week of Avon. The second week was preparation, and the third week is joy, and next week we'll be talking about love. But for right now, the scripture that is that is associated with this uh, theme of joy is Matthew chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. Matthew 2, verses 10 to 11. And what it says is that when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They presented gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So this, this evening, we will be, I will be actually reading from the, uh, the New King James translation or the New King James Version of the Bible as we go through this study. So, as we stated earlier, we find ourselves in the third week of Advent, uh, which symbolizes joy and peace. Uh, the scripture associated here, as I indicated to you, as I read earlier, Matthew 2, 10 to 11, talks about the wise men or the Magi coming to find Jesus. Um, so, we want to reflect on these two scriptures and give you some insight on uh, why is it that uh, they saw the star and they rejoice and they had this of uh, great joy and then they and then they worship Christ and then also uh, they presented him with gifts. So before going into our scripture, let us reflect first on the first nine uh, uh, verses of. Matthew chapter 2, the first nine verses. So chapter 2 here opens with the birth of Christ and a wise man seeing his star in the east. And so chapter 2 here actually is talking about the wise man seeing Jesus' star in the east. And I want us to begin to look at this here where uh, uh, the wise men see Jesus star in the east and they inquire about Jesus to Herod. Now, just let us just think for a minute. The star, the wise men saw the star in the east. The star directed them to Jerusalem and it disappeared. And now, now they, 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 they don't know where the star is. It's because they, they don't know where Jesus is because now the star brought them to a specific place and they don't see the star anymore. And so now they go to Herod and they begin to ask Herod, inquire from Herod about this king that is seeing the star in the east and they have followed him. But let's talk about stars for a minute. Let's talk about stars for a minute. Now, Stars are used for several things in the Bible. Stars are used for several things in the Bible. They are used to represent angels. If you look at Revelation 
in Revelation uh, uh, chapter 1, in Revelation chapter 1, verses 20, it says here, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. So, stars here in the Bible represents angels. Now, but it does not only represent angels here. Uh, star also here represents uh, leaders in the church. If you look at Revelation also chapter 12, in Revelation chapter 12, um, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 here, it states here, and there appeared a great woman, a great wonder in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So stars also represent uh, leaders. Now, if you want to, to, to look at, uh, going back to where I said stars also represent angels, if you look at uh, Revelation 12 and 4, uh, Job 38 and 7, and Psalm 147 and 4, all talks of a star, referring to stars as angels. Now, uh, there are some commentators, I read Revelation 12 and 1, and there are some commentators that, 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 that interpret stars to be the 12 apostles that is being talked about in this particular scripture. Uh, stars is also used to guide people because the stars are constant and they are very bright. They are constant and they are very bright. If you, uh, 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 I live most of my life in the, in the, in the city and where there is a lot of lights. Sometimes it becomes difficult for you to, to, to see a star in a big city. But if you look really uh, uh, carefully, the, the, the shiniest object in the sky is always the star. Uh, living out here in the, in, the, in the rural setting, it's just easy for you to see a star. You can just walk outside and look up and you see a star. And the beauty of a star is that even though sometimes there may be a cloud, but that star will push through that cloud and you will see the light. And so that's how shiny the star, star, uh, a star are. Stars are very uh, unique because, uh, especially in, in, the, in the days of old, people used to use the star as the constellations in the star to be able to navigate on the high seas. And they will, they will use the star, and that's where we got this thing from the North Star. You follow the North Star because it takes you to certain places. And so now, the, but the star here led these men to Jerusalem. And interestingly to note, the star disappeared. <laughs> I mean, it took them. Now, the question comes to mind. Why is it that the star couldn't just lead them directly to Christ? But it led them to Jerusalem and it disappeared. And so, and so they needed to ask Herod for direction. And the, the, the Bible is so unique that it tells us that once they ask Herod about this, about this new king that has been born, after everything was said and done, and Herod told them that, you know, go and find the king and when you find the king, you know, let me know so I can go and worship him. As soon as they depart from Herod's mansion or castle or whatever you want to call it, or his presence, the star appears again. So the Bible tells us that uh, now when they left Herod, the star appeared and led them to Christ. So based on our various definitions that we talk about stars here, um, now, this is, this is Pastor John's conclusion. <laughs> and I'm concluding two things. First, the star was an angel from God guiding these wise men. 
guiding the Mag Magi. And secondly, the star symbolizes Jesus' mission to the world. That is, that you can find in, uh, if you look in John chapter 8, uh, in John chapter 8, verses, and I'll find that real quick. In John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 12. John 8 and 12 here talks about, it talks as in, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have light of life. So my conclusion here is that the star also symbolizes Jesus Christ. That was Jesus' star. It was the angel that was guiding these my guy and taking them to see Jesus. So this brings us to verse 10. So that was just a quick look at the first nine uh, 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 verses in uh, Matthew chapter 2. And we now we find ourselves in verse 10. And verse 10 here tells us that when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When they saw the star. So as soon as they left Herod's presence, when they got out there and saw the star, they began to rejoice because they said, oh, wow, this is the son of God. We have seen him. And so here, they begin to have that great joy because the star was going to take them now to the Christ child. Remember earlier, the star that they saw in the east, that they followed to, to Jerusalem, and then all of a sudden it disappeared. And now this star has reappeared. Matthew Henry states in his commentary, he states that he said, extraordinary helps are not to be expected where ordinary means are to be had. He says that extraordinary helps are not to be expected where ordinary means are to be had. Why did I quote this? I quote this specifically because these wise men, these maga, they had the extraordinary help from God that took them to Jerusalem. And when they got to Jerusalem, the star disappeared, and now they began to use their own ordinary means of trying to find God. If we relate this to our lives, we can look at and say that, look, there are times that we need this extraordinary help. And then when it comes, we have it with us. But then we feel like maybe we are doing it all on our own. And then we lose that extraordinary help. And we begin to do things on our own. And we try to use our ordinary means to get things done. The wise man guidance from the east was to get to the Christ child. And so when they got to the place where they have received it and they start disappearing, now they find themselves in a place where they needed to use their own wisdom. But interestingly to note, once they left Herod, they got back on track. This week of Advent signifies joy and peace. The joy of finding the star, Jesus Christ, who is that constant in our lives at all times. Jesus Christ is that star which is constant in our lives, and we need to specifically and intentionally focus on Christ. Not only during this time of Advent, but all through the year and the year, the year that is coming to coming upon us. Remember earlier the representation of the star? It is a constant. And constancy means that it never changes. Clouds might come and clouds will go. We might have dark clouds in our in, 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 in our in our lives. Like for example, 
This COVID-19 is a dark cloud that we are dealing with. But once we have that constant star, which is Jesus Christ, yes, we will continue to move forward. Another thing that I want, I, I want to share here is that we must continue to rekindle our commitment to follow Jesus Christ. Not only through this week, where we, when once we see that star, it, it gives us joy and happiness. We must continue to rekindle Christ in our lives by doing those things that will keep us closer to God. If you remember, the Israelites were led by a pillar of fire to the promised land. Likewise, the wise men, the Magi, they were led by a star, a light, to the promised sea, which is Jesus Christ. He is that bright and morning star. And we must continue to rekindle that star in our lives. And so moving further, we look at verse 11. Verse 11 says that, And when they were come to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened the treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The first thing I want us to look at here is that, let me share this with you, because this is something that I, I, I that's so interesting. If you look in the gospel, the full gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it is only Matthew and Luke that talks about Jesus' birth. They give us an idea of a, 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 a visionary uh, explanation of Jesus' childhood, his birth, and part of his childhood. Only Matthew and Luke. Those are the two that talks about it. These two gospels provide us with what we know today as the Christmas story. It provides us with what we know today as the Christmas story. Now, another thing that is so interesting in these two gospels, as I was doing my study for, 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 this, for this evening, is that in Matthew, in Luke chapter 2, the angels appear to the shepherd. The angels appear to the shepherd. And after the angels appear to the shepherd, the shepherd visited Jesus in the manger or the barn or the stable or whatever you want to call that. But the angels, the, the, the shepherd, after the angels visited the shepherd, the shepherd went to Jesus in, 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 in the barn. In Matthew chapter 2, the star, the my guy, the wise man, saw the star in the east. They were not visited by the angels. They saw the star in the east. And they allowed that star, they followed that star to Jerusalem and then later on to Bethlehem to visit the, the child. Also, to, interestingly to note here is that in Matthew chapter 2 here, it says here that uh, and when they were come into the house. So Jesus was no more in the manger. Jesus was no more in the stable. He was born in the stable or in the manger. And then later on, his parents were able to afford a place for them to stay after he was born. So maybe you say maybe about five days or 10 days after his birth because he was still a baby. So they were able to afford a place for him to, to stay. And so here we find that the my guy. So in Matthew chapter two is that the, the wise man visited Jesus. Luke doesn't say anything about the wise man. Luke talks about the shepherd. So that's one thing that I want us to take from there. Um, 
Another thing that we need to observe here is that they came to the house to visit Christ. They found Christ in a house. They didn't find him in a mansion. He was not in a castle. He was not in a palace. But he was in like a humble home. He didn't have servants that were waiting on him. There was no fanfare and pageantry. He was in a simple, humble house. And so probably, you know, I mean, my imagination would probably run wild and I would say, you know, maybe it was someone that had a one bedroom that was available and, and you know, they asked and they said, well, yeah, you can just use this room. And so, because they said he was in a house and not in a home. So my guess is that, you know, they rented one room in, in a house and that's where they were in. But what I, they, take, they, they take away from there is that Jesus was in a humble, simple place. And these wise men, knowing that they have seen the star, they knew that he was royalty. They could have said, no, this is not the king. Because a royal king would not be living in a, a one bedroom uh, in, 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 in a house. He would be in a castle. The beauty here is that the wise men were wise enough with the knowledge of God to look through that veil of that simple and humbleness to see the royalty of Christ. They were able to look beyond that and see the royalty of Christ. And you know, that reminds me of how sometimes we see things from the outside and we say, well, you know, this is not, you know, this is not it. Instead of us taking the time to look beyond, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a saying out there that don't judge a book by its cover, <laughs> you know, and that, that, that was it. These wise men did not just judge Christ because of where he lived. They looked beyond that. Now, there are some prophets that made the mistake of just judging people from what they see. If you remember, if you go in your, if you look in your Bible to uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, uh, I mean, 1 Samuel chapter 16 in verse 7 here, uh, in chapter 16, 1 Samuel, God tells Samuel to go and anoint the new king of Israel. He sent him to the house of Jesse. Now, Jesse has all these sons. Some of them huge. Some of them got broad shoulders and, you know, good looking and all that. And he goes there and the first person he sees he said, in, in, in uh, uh, verse 6, it says, And it came to pass when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before thee. I mean, he looked at Eliab. I mean, I can imagine that that, 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 that cat probably had broad shoulders, maybe six, six, five, you know, all strong and muscles and looking up there. And he looked at him and said, Yes, this is the Lord's anointed. And what did God tell Samuel? God says it in, 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 verse, in verse 7. He said, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his statue, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as men seeth. For men looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God looks at our heart. During this time of Advent, it is the time for us to say, Lord, help us to look beyond what we see of others around us. We need to look on the heart. And so here, the wise men look beyond the veil of what they saw, and they saw the royalty of, of God. The next thing here to note here is that is 
The Bible tells us that they fell down and worshiped him. They fell down and worshiped him. No, the first thing they did was to worship the Christ child. They looked beyond what they saw, they saw royalty. And they fell down and worshiped him. Now, if you read the Bible, there is nowhere in scripture where it says that when they met Herod, they worship him. Or they fell down to worship him. There's nowhere in there. There's nowhere where they talk about how they, you know, would give reference to, to Herod. Because Herod was the ruler. But they fell down. As soon as they saw the Christ child, they fell down and worshipped him. It is so important that we understand what it means to get on our knees and worship God. We must continue to know that in worshiping God, going on our knees means that we have put God above us. The significance of getting on your knees here means that this particular person that you are uh, uh, getting on your knees and worshiping, they are sovereign. You are showing them their sovereignty. You are letting them know that they are higher than you. Psalm 95 and 6 tells us here that, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. That tells us that there are several places in the Bible where it talk, tells us about kneeling down before God. We must always remember that it is important to get on our knees to worship God. We must worship the King of Kings. On our knees, we must worship the rose of Sharon. You know, I always uh, 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 I, I, I share this uh, most of the times when I, when, I, when I think about being on my knees. And Denzel Washington, one of our uh, famous uh, actor, he gives a speech to some, I think it was a school or whatever, and he talks about several things. But one of the things he said is that, he said he's always, he always prayed. And he said, he told, the, he told the people he was speaking to, he said, when you go to bed tonight, take your slippers and put it all the way under your bed so that when you wake up in the morning, you will have to get on your knees to pull your slipper. And while you are on your knees, say a prayer. And I heard that the first time I heard that, I went exactly and did it. <laughs> Because, you know, you know, in the morning, you wake up, you're so tired, and you're like, well, okay, I would just lie down here and say, Lord, thank you for this day, and then and, and you get up and go do what you got to do. And so that night, I went to bed, I put my slippers over the bed, and got up in the morning, and then when I looked down, I couldn't find my slippers, I said, okay, I'm going to the bed, and I got on my knees, I was like, oh, boy, I'm already on my knees. <laughs> but, you know, it's something that is simple. But it's so important. The wise men realized that getting on their knees was so important to worship the Christ child. And so they got on their knees. Uh, also, Philippians 2 and 10, Ephesians 3 and 14, talks about bowing in worship because it shows that honor to God. It shows that honor to God. But also, you know, <laughs> Satan knows the importance of being on your knees to worship. And so what did he do? If you remember during Jesus, uh, when, when Jesus started his ministry, he got baptized. And after that, he went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. What was one of the things that Satan took? 
Satan tried to reclaim his glory by allowing, by, by, by trying to, to uh, 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 talk Christ into getting on his knees so that he can worship him. If you remember in uh, the book of Matthew, in Matthew uh, chapter 4, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 9 here, Satan states here, uh, he states here, and said unto him, All these things will I give if thou will fall down and worship me. So Satan understands what it means to be on your knees because when you get on your knees, you are lifting that person high. And so he tried to reclaim his glory by tricking Christ to get on his knees and say, I will give you all this. And so that is why it is so important and it's mentioned here that they fell down on their knees. Uh, also, God also instructed the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 8 through 9, where he told them that they should not bow down to any graven image when he was giving them the laws. He told them, don't bow down. Because when you bow down and you get on your knees to an image, that means you are putting that thing above you. And so, they, it is so important for us to be on our knees. And these wise men understood the importance of being on your knees. And so during this time of Advent, this is one of the things that we can recommit ourselves to. That every night before I go to bed, or when I wake up in the morning, I will get on my knees and worship Christ. That's something for us to think about. And then lastly, this is the, the beauty of this chapter here. Lastly, it states here that um, lastly, it talks about the gift. The gifts that were presented to Christ. And it says here that after they saw the uh, and when they were come in the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. We already talked about that. And when they had opened the treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What is so important about these three gifts? What is so important about these three gifts? Now, one of the things that uh, I was, when I was studying here, I was reading about here, was that um, we always say the three wise men, but the Bible really did not tell us that they were three. They could have been four, they could have been five, they could have been six, they could have been even more than that. But we say three wise men because of the gifts that was given. You know, and so um, this is just a side note that they, they, they could have been more than three. <laughs> but the importance of this gift, uh, these three gifts, according to some theologians, uh, have a specific, specific meaning. They represent uh, three key aspects of Christ's ministry. These three gifts. Now, the deep spiritual symbolism of Christ include the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Now, the gold represents Christ's kingship, his royalty. Gold here yeah, signifies, you know, that, 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 that uh, wealth, that royalty of Jesus Christ. Frankincense which is uh, an expensive fragrance from India and Arabia, symbolize his priestly role and his divinity. And then myrrh is another fragrance uh, um, that is used for embalming. 
Uh, it is very costly. It's a costly perfume made from rare torn bushes in Arabia and Ethiopia that is used as an antiseptic anointing oil and embalming fluid. So what is so important here is that the gold here represents cross, uh, Christ's royalty, Jesus Christ's royalty, his, 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 his divinity. The frankincense here represents his priestly role, the work that he came to do on earth. And then the myrrh is to remind us that his time would come when he will be crucified and where he would die and be buried. And so these three gifts are so important, it's so significant towards, towards Jesus Christ. But you know, the third gift here is, 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 very, is very odd because how will you go to a newborn baby, a baby that is just born, and you give, you give the, the parents a gift of myrrh? You know, in those days, those people knew what those things meant. You know, they knew that this was for an embalming fluid and this was for, uh, you know, and, and wealth and, and, the, and this expensive perfume. And so this was kind of odd. But the thing here to note here is that it reminds us that even though Christ was going to die, but he was going to be raised from the dead in three days. And that's the beauty. It just reminds us that the goal is so important because it talks about Christ's royalty. Know that he is from a royal blood, a royal bloodline, which is God Almighty. And then the Frankenstein here taught, tell us that Christ will walk in his humanity with us. He would come down. He would come in his human flesh. He would be with us. He would perform miracles. He would experience some of the things that we have experienced, our hardship. He would come from a humble beginning. But then also the murder here now let us know that Christ will die. And each and every one of us will have to die one day. But that's, that's the whole symbolism of this gift. Why do we now rejoice in this time of Advent? Why is it called the week of joy? Well, on the issue of gifts, Matthew Henry reminds us in his commentary that we must give up all that we have to Jesus Christ. And if we be sincere in the surrender of ourselves to him, we shall not be unwilling to part with what is dearest to us and most valuable to him and for him. Nor are our gifts accepted unless we first present ourselves to him, living sacrifices. What does that mean? What Matthew Henry is telling us here is that we must begin to give, give up all that is dear to us just for Jesus Christ. Yes, once we surrender ourselves to Christ, and allow Christ to have that which is so important in our lives. <clears throat> the gift of surrendering our lives to Christ is so important because we present ourselves as a living sacrifice, just as Jesus Christ presented himself as a living sacrifice. Those three gifts of Frankenstein, I mean, gold, Frankenstein, and myrrh, they really symbolize 
Christ's ministry on earth. He came in his royal fashion. He was born into a humble beginning. But yet and still, it was still joy. It was still peaceful. Yes, there was things surrounding his death, his, his birth, where Herod was trying to, you know, kill him. And a lot of young children died. A lot of babies died because Herod was trying to get rid of him. But yet and still, when you look at it, you will say, well, it was not joyful for those parents who were losing their babies. But it was still joyful because a savior had been born. And his life was going to be the redemption of all our sins. And so as we move forward here, we realize that the Frankenstein that was presented to him really talks about his ministry, the way how he started his ministry by teaching in the temple at the age of 12. You know, I mean, yes, it was, it was, it was something that was very traumatic for his parents because when they looked down and they, and they couldn't find him and they realized that, you know, he was missing, I can imagine how Mary fell and Joseph, you know, going all the way back there and then finding him in the temple, you know. But he knew that from an early age that he had no time to waste. He had no time to play around. He had to get to work immediately as soon as he reached to that age. And so the Frankenstein here symbolizes his priestly role within with, uh, uh, during his time on earth. His divinity, human, but yet still God. He was able to show the people that there was a reason for his presence on earth. And so during this time of Advent, it is a time for us to recommit ourselves to Christ. Begin to see things beyond what we are seeing. Also, it talks about the murder, and I know that sometimes we don't like to talk about death. But the bottom line here was that death was not the end. I know that, that there's, a, there's a song that says that uh, the grave could not hold him because his work, when they thought that they had defeated Christ, when Satan thought that his work was done and he, was, he had put Christ to life, I mean to, to death, and it was over with, and he could go and rest himself. God said, no, not yet. And after three days, he rose from the dead. And that is the foundation, the cornerstone of our faith. As we celebrate this Christ child, in the next few days, let us remember that Jesus Christ, his humility, his humble beginning was so important to show each and every one of us that we need to identify and be humble in our service to God. Also, this week, we we light the third candle, which is the pink candle, which is called the shepherd's candle. Uh, last, last week, uh, I talked a little bit about a shepherd and where we said that, you know, the sheep know the sound of its shepherd. We should begin 
to listen to the sound of Christ the shepherd. Uh, in the book of Luke, Luke reminds us that the first group of people that the angel visited was the shepherd. And, you know, you might probably say, why is that so? Uh, how, how true is that? Well, based on scripture, it says that after the angels visited the shepherd, they went to the stable. As compared to the wise men seeing his star in the east and visited Christ at the house. So that tells me that the first group of people that, they, that, they, that, that, that got to know about the good news were the shepherds. And it's so significant for us in our faith with Christ. Because what that tells us is that, you know, uh, the shepherds are so important because they protect the sheep. They keep them. They make sure that you know, they, uh, they are safe. And also those sheep knows the voice of the shepherd. So hence the shepherd candle is lit during this week of Advent. The shepherd brings us great joy. The angels announced that Jesus came for each and every one of us. The angels went to the shepherd. Unimportant people. They are there with sheep all day. So you know, you know, they, they, they're in the field. You know, you know, they, they, they're, not, they're not clean. They, they uh, 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 got uh, an odor about themselves. Out there with those sheep all day, you know, in, in, the, in the open. As we look forward to this week, this is the middle of the week. And as we move into the end of this week, let us continue to trust in God. Let us give Christ that part of our life that we can say, well, this is the time for us to recommit. As we went through this particular scripture of Matthew chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, I just want to recap one or two things here. One here is that the first thing is the star. Let Jesus Christ be that star. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. It was the second time they saw the star. The first time they saw the star, it was when they were in the east. And they brought them all the way to Jerusalem. And then when they left Herod, they saw the star. The star reappeared. That star symbolizes Jesus Christ, the light of the world. The light of the world. And so they, had, they were in great joy. The next thing that I want us to take away from here is that where he was, he was in a house. He was not in a mansion. He was not in a palace. He was in a common house. And what does that mean for you and myself? It's for us to look beyond what we see. Let's take this time of Advent to look beyond what we see of others. Begin to care for those that are around us. The time of sharing, the time of joy. Let us do that. And then lastly, they fell down and worshiped him. They fell down and worshiped him. Remember, let us continue to go on our knees to worship Christ. Because it shows reverence to God, to Jesus, 
and to the Holy Spirit. And then those three gifts, his ministry, which actually talks about his royalty, his priestly role on earth, and his death, knowing that he was going to die. But then the joy of that is that after three days, he rose from the dead. So having concluded on this note, we begin to see that next week, Sunday, we begin to light the fourth candle, which is love. And then also uh, the white candle, which is the Christ candle. But as we move through uh, the next couple of days and move into next week uh, of Advent, let us continue to have Christ as the focus in all that we do. Because as the saying goes, Jesus is the reason for the season. Amen. All right, we have a few more minutes. Uh, I will entertain any questions, uh, any comments that we, that we can share with each other as we move forward. All right. Tyson, we got anything in the comment box? This evening, we are down here at the Ebenezer Church, and I have uh, two, six, seven people with me in here, and I'm happy to see that. And I have two online, uh, Janelle and Miss Patricia, and then we have our own mother here with us this evening, along with Crystal, Calvin, Travis, Penny, some guy back there working the computer thing. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I have siblings, and I know how we are. And it's in here when Jesus, you know, we know Mary has other children, mm -hmm. and he is a perfect child. How do you think they saw that? <laughs> you know, you know, interestingly to this. I'm like, you always talk about a favorite child. I'm like, whoo. Competing with Jesus, that would be hard. Yes, that, that was that's something that uh, it was kind of difficult. Um, well, you know, the Bible really didn't <laughs> explain that to us, <laughs> you know, know, because it talks about only uh, uh, him being uh, 12 years old and, you know, getting away from his, his parents. And that was something that I know probably Joseph tried to maybe discipline him and he probably said, no, you're not my daddy. <laughs> well, uh, but, you know, that's something to, to think about. You know, how, how, how did they uh, manage, you know, with that? Um, I know the Bible talks about his brother. Um, somebody help me with this. James, yes. His brother, James. And... And his brother became um, one of the one of the uh, 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 leaders in in, in in the synagogue. So so it, it was more like you know Jesus pretty much, uh, and then also Jesus would have probably pretty much set the example for every, each and every one of them growing up, you know, because maybe that's why James just followed in his first step and said, "You got to remember Joseph was a carpenter." And in those days, the 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 the, uh, the kids uh, follow in their father's footsteps. You know, the, the trade that they did, so they will obviously you know become a carpenter. But then you find that Jesus was preaching, and and then he became uh, you know a, 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 what we call the subject matter expert in law. And then you also had. Uh, James going into ministry. So that was maybe there was probably maybe some discussion in the home that hey, why are all these kids going this way? 
you know? So, well, so that's well, something. And as for John, I was just going to say real quick that I've read this before and I was not aware or did not come to mind that they didn't see the star for a while. You know, lost sight of the star and seen it. Yeah. I cannot say I was aware of that. Oh, okay. And and another thing, John, I think you did a real good job. I think our church needs to have an old night prayer meeting Sunday. Yeah. One, <laughs> no, no, one of these days, you know, uh, those old, old uh, um, 10 revivals. <laughs> but yeah, uh, you know, uh, as I was as I was studying this, um, it kind of it kind of occurred to me that you know we read we read the scriptures and sometimes we kind of overlook certain things and you know pay attention to it and so that kind of uh, caught my attention and to say wait okay if they saw the star in the east why did the star didn't just take them straight to where Jesus was. Instead, they had to come to Jerusalem and, and then um, meet with Herod, ask Herod about the, the child. And then once they left Herod, then the star reappears. So, you know, and that's something that I'm going to read more about and, and, and maybe get more, more insight on, you know, but there, there's there's various there's various uh, 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 theological meaning on that, and you know we can look at it in so many ways. Pastor John, yes, I, I find it interesting that Matthew was the only one of the four Gospels to record this, and I wondered why the others didn't choose to put that in their Gospel. Um. Uh, and that's something that uh, we can look into. But if you, if you notice, Matthew recorded the one with the wise men, and Luke recorded the one with the shepherd. So in Luke chapter 2, he talks about the shepherd, and in Matthew, he talks about the wise men. So those are the two gospels that, 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 that talk about, about you know, people going to visit Jesus. And interestingly to note that in Mark and John, they just jump straight into Jesus's ministry. Mm -hmm. The writer didn't talk much about, you know, his, his, his early childhood. They just went straight into his ministry and talked about how, you know, like in uh, John talks about his first, um, his first miracle. Uh, and then and then Mark begins to talk about John the Baptist and, and everything else. So it's so it's, it's so interesting that they all come up with this uh, different aspect of Jesus's life, but then it all connects as you begin to read it. Wasn't Matthew the tax collector before Jesus met him? So he probably would be into the census and all that, like giving the background of some people. Of I mean, you're of this lineage because he's dealing with lineage too. Yes. So, like I said, he probably was very into the details and all the accounting of all the different stuff. Mm hmm. So, <laughs> I forgot to mention that we also got our back there, our our men's uh, ministry coordinator. And, and supervisor, he's 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 our 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 great no uh Tyson Tyson just trying to 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 I I'll, I'll just give him the <laughs> yeah just give him the credit <laughs> but yeah so anyway well uh, any more comments that we. So as we prepare ourselves for, for Christmas, you know, I, I love this uh, setting. Uh, uh, this is one of my other setting. Uh, I, don't, I can't take credit for this. This is all from Crystal. So uh, I gave Crystal the shout out. <laughs> last week, last week, the setting there was from uh, Sharon. So I gave Sharon the shout out on that one from, from Madison. <laughs> so, so, 
But um, as we come to a close, let us just remember that uh, Jesus is the reason for the season, like I said earlier. And let us spread the joy of this Christmas. Yes, we know that we are in a, a grim situation with this uh, pandemic and, and, and all that. But let us look out there to see who we can share the joy of Jesus Christ with. So having said that, uh, please join me in our closing prayer. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we once more give you honor, glory, and praise. We thank you for this time of fellowship. We pray now that your word that has gone forth, we know will now return to you, Lord. We thank you for giving us the information that we can begin to look deeper and deeper into your word with great understanding. We thank you for your Holy Spirit for providing us with that knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to know you more and more. And God, as we go through this week and start the next week of looking forward towards the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray that you continue to rest, rule, and abide with us as we depart this place, but never from your presence. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all for coming, um, whether online, uh, in person. We just want to give you a thanks and, and our appreciation. Okay. This concludes our study for this evening.